Um, yeah, so uh, I'll say good morning, good afternoon, whichever, wherever you are in the world. Uh, I can see you've got some friends on there, some people are not friends yet, but uh, we'll get there. Um, let's make a start. We're going to talk about uh, why the harness fitting is important and also keeping it clean and, and looking after it. Um, so we're just going to run through a few things. Uh, this is what we're going to look at today. I've got a little contents list here. So who am I? Why am I talking to you? What right do I have to talk to you about harness? Um, the problems that we see with harness in developing countries. Uh, most of my work is in places like Africa, India, uh, Central America. Uh, for the last 20 years, I've been making a I'll say a career out of that. It's been my job for 20 years. Uh, before that, I was a harness maker. But um, so we're going to look at some of the things I see overseas. We'll have breaks. I've got a break in number three, which is a question and answer break. But we'll have breaks as and when Ben has enough questions to put in. So you're all hopefully sending questions into him. Um, the common problems we see with donkeys in the UK and Europe, and uh, I guess the United States as well. I don't know much about the United States. Uh, what options have we got? Um, and how is the donkey sanctuary looking to provide help and support on harness? Uh, we've got lots of plans at the moment, and um, I'll talk to you a little bit about those. I've got some useful uh, addresses and websites for you, which I hope will be um, will be interesting. And I've got a few photos to show you and stuff like that. So uh, there we go. That's where we'll make a start. So who am I? Uh, I trained as a saddler in the UK in um, I started in about in 1989, I think it was. Um, I had my own business in the UK for a while and one day just, just in a coffee break at work I just decided to pick up the phone and make a call to a horse charity who were looking for trainers overseas um, and three months later, two months later I found myself virtually for the first time in my life I was on a plane to Mexico to go and train students in Mexico on their behalf. Um, that was the start of a whole new way of life for me but in Two or three years, we sort of um, might become a full time international trainer. Uh, in 2008, I got an opportunity to apply for a job at the Donkey Sanctuary, which I grabbed with both hands. Um, and it started off sort of helping the teams in the developing countries that we had main um, bases in. And it was very much sort of go along with the vets, and they were treating a wound under a heart piece of harness, and they would treat the wound every time they went because obviously the harness was the problem and the wound just kept coming back. So my first year or so was really just getting to know what was going on and helping them to solve the problem with the harness. But then suddenly uh, some, some of the guys, the junior guys, mostly the drivers, the uh, animal health assistants, AHAs, if you hear anybody say AHA, that's what that means. They started saying, oh, Chris, we really love what you're doing. Can we learn a bit? And we started training them. And so it was great. At the moment, as uh, Ben mentioned, I live in New Zealand, and um, so we're sort of working on new ideas for harness. We're trying to, I'll talk more about that later, I think it'd be better. So uh, we're working on online training courses, which we'll talk about later as well. So the, the thing with the, any improvement in welfare anywhere in the world is that education and training are the keys. So we're looking at ways that we can support that at the moment. Um, as it's, it's a, a sort of a change for us a bit, but it's, it's a very interesting change. It's a very involved and very technical change, which, um, as Ben mentioned, certainly people like me, we struggle a bit with the technology, but we're getting there with a, with a bit of help from a few friends. Um, just on the side, I also, as a saddle and harness maker, I spend, take every opportunity I can to work with animals, so I don't own any at the moment. Um, I started actual hands-on if you like on the reins with the uh, rda back in 90, 95 96 uh, but i've always loved working with animals um i think there's, there's something phenomenal about the, the, the connection you get when you're actually working with an animal it's incredible uh, especially in forestry that's just unbelievable um, so I get down lucky here. I found uh, John and Fiona. I know they're listening. I hear John and Fiona. Um, they let me come down to their farm down in Taranaki, which is in uh, central North Island on the coast there, or near the coast. Beautiful place. And they have Pondui donkeys, uh, which they've rescued off the island of Pondui a couple of years ago. Beautiful donkeys, uh, feral. 
but the first time I met them, they weren't, hadn't been at the farm long. They'd only been there a couple of weeks. And Zach, the, uh, the stallion, or the jack, came over to say hello, which is just incredible, the feral donkeys. But um, they're really nice. Sort of standard size, nothing very big, but uh, beautiful animals. Uh, so I go down there and we play some, well, play. I work, sorry, I don't play. Um, I work with new ideas for the harness. We try and add a whole new, a whole range of uh, mostly collars, but also trying to make a range of practical working harness that doesn't cost an arm and a leg. Some of it we can take over to uh, places in the developing world where we can, we're working on collars we can make out of a hedgerow basically. Uh, so we can trial those, we can test them on the, on the, at the donkey sanctuary, but we need to try them properly on the farm. We need to work with them to see if they work before we send them out. So that's what we do. We don't know with John and uh, Fiona down at Taranaki. So um, this is my first webinar. So uh, yeah, but I'm not used to sitting here talking to a screen. Um, I'm more used to working with a group of people. And so please, if you've got any questions, please pitch in. Uh, help me to feel I'm not on my own here. <laughs> So, as I said, most of my experience comes from working in developing countries. So I'll start there. Um, worked out some figures for a uh, another uh, talk I'm doing later today, actually. Um, according to the FAO, that's the Food and Agriculture Organization of the United Nations, there are 42 to 44 million working donkeys out there. And most of those would be in developing countries. And the, the few that we have in the UK and other places are I don't know, probably less than a million. Um, most of them would be in Africa, uh, Asia, Central America. And they're pretty much dismissed. Nobody really thinks about the donkeys. But then you start to put some figures together. I've worked this out by looking at the, uh, I looked online at two or three sources and found out that there are 600 million people dependent on donkeys in the world today. And I've sort of worked a little bit on that and found out the minimum wage, if you like. And if you work that out, it's something like $5 a day. If you say that uh, there's an average of uh, five people in a family and they're earning $5 a day as a family, those donkeys are producing $575 million a day. And if you say that uh, the six hundred million people all getting $5 a day, that figure goes up to, I'm not even trying to say that, $2,875 million a day, and that's from donkeys. So it's, it's, it's staggering to me that the actual donkey is still disregarded as a, an important beast in the 21st century. What's the problems we see? First of all, the lack of harness. We don't get any harness. You can see in this picture here that um, the, the sacks are just roped straight onto the donkey's back. Um, Poverty is a massive problem, obviously, because um, people who have nothing beyond the next meal don't have, really have time to think about the welfare of anything but themselves. So we go in there, you know, got to love your donkey and take care of your donkey, and then look, look at you like you're crazy. Um, incomplete harness, we'll look at some of that a bit later. There's a lot of places where they have some idea, so they use a breast collar or don't use a saddle or they don't use a bridging. Um, they have no access to training and there's very little, <coughs> excuse me, there's very little um, folklore handed down, if you like, with the donkeys. They work with the donkeys, most people, from when they're five or six years old and they just treat donkeys the way that everybody else treats them. There's no training as such, there's no understanding of the donkey itself. They don't know how harness should work in most countries. Even where they have harness, they don't actually understand how to fit it or use it. And in many places, they're just not aware there's a problem. Um, and we also think, well, how can you not be aware when we see some of the pictures that we see online in places? Um, but then, you know, we do. We, we, we went last time we went down to the shops, and then maybe some time ago for some of you, or most of you, or all of us, uh, how many homeless people did you see, or how much rubbish did you see on the street? You might not have seen any. It's there, but you just don't see it because you are so used to it. And for people to get up in the morning every day and see the wounds on the donkeys, it's just what's there. They don't think about it. 
So where, where there is harness, we find that it's made from poor materials and it's very badly made, nuts and bolts, nails, screws. It's poorly designed. Hitching points are a big thing. People tend to tie their donkey to their cart by the nearest available area they can tie a rope onto, basically. So it can be pretty rough. Um, and when we see the, the attempts at harness and that we would recognize, that's mostly in countries that have a colonial past. Um, so they have an idea what harness was, but that idea is now 60 or 70 years old. It's been passed down through five or six generations. They couldn't quite work out why granddad used that strap, so they've thrown it in the bin. Um, and things change and there's nobody putting them right, apart from people like ourselves. So it's kind of, um, it's kind of a difficult um, situation we have down there or around there. This is a, a necklace collar. Um, th those barrels will be full of water, so there's quite a lot of weight on the barrels. This, as you can see, there's nothing else on there. There's no saddles, no bridging. Everything works off the neck. So it's uh, quite difficult to walk in there and start talking about saddles and bridging and everything because the guys look at you and go, what are you talking about? And of course, for them, it's easy. The, the cart is, the shafts are on the floor. They walk the donkeys in, they pull the shafts up and put the donkey's head through and they go. Uh, it's an easy system. We start talking about all these other straps and bits and pieces that they should have. And of course, their immediate reaction is, uh, are you crazy? Why would I want to do all that? My donkey still goes. Why do I need to change? Um, one of the big problems we have in Africa, I don't know if we've got anybody from Africa online yet, I know there's a few coming in, is the, uh, the, the, the ox yoke carts, the two wheelers with a single shaft, they're heavy, um, sometimes they have the necklace system on like the one that we saw in the last picture, uh, but very often they're just still using the ox yokes, and this is because probably 200 years ago, the ox was a very, very common animal. It was used a lot for harnessing the massive oxen teams, uh, especially down in South Africa, uh, up the east side of Africa. Ox were, oxen were very, very important. Drought, disease, other problems of sort of, they kill off the oxen all the time. And it's quite common to see an ox and a donkey in ox harness pulling a plow or pulling a cat, or now two donkeys is also common. But of course, a donkey isn't an ox. It doesn't have to the muscle, muscles that an ox has in the neck and can't take the weight there. <clears throat> uh, you can see in this picture, uh, another common problem we have is that the breaching works straight off the saddle. So when the animal stops, the cart keeps going forward, the shafts go forward, the saddle tries to go forward because nothing's stopping it until the breaching tightens up uh, and the girth tightens up. So we get some big wounds under the saddle and some girth went to the well from that. Not a good system. Uh, here's one of the, um, this is an ox cart. You can't see the actual cart in that photo, uh, but you can see, I don't know, can you see my cursor if I roll my cursor over? Oh, she's a video. Just remember that. Let me just watch that a second. There we go. So you get some idea of what the card is like. You can also see that guy is actually quite good with his donkeys. He's quite gentle with them. He's controlling by whistles and just by taps with the stick. He's quite a good guy. You can see the conditions of the roads. Uh, that's an interesting point. And that card, of course, is empty, but you can see the weight of that card just as a, you know, an empty card. So we'll get on to... Uh, we'll leave that behind for the time being, unless we have some questions coming in on that. Yeah, Chris. For Chris, can yeah, you hear me? Uh, a couple yeah. of questions here for you, just um, that are relevant to what you've been saying. And that's ask, uh, do they train them to drive or just put them in to work? So in your experience, you know, are, they, are those just literally, let's hitch them up and go? Or um, do they have a bit more training than that? Yeah, well, um, uh, when they when the Jennies are pregnant, they won't get much time off work. And as soon as that foal can keep up with the mother, then the foal will be following. So it'll, 
even from a few you know a few weeks old almost it's it's, it's following along alongside as it gets bigger it will be tied in alongside the pair or the single donkey that's working uh, by the time it gets to about two years old it's looking pretty much full size and that's about when they, most of them will start working between two and three years old so they don't get trained as such they just pick it up as they go along cool and uh sarah's sarah she's asked um she's been told in the past donkeys can pull more or better than they can carry is this true this kind of is going to open a big debate so let's not spend too long on this chris i know this is always a challenging question but um yeah any any tips yeah. for sarah it's a massive question because we're looking at the uh, the weights that they can pull and carry very closely at the moment um i mean it's true that they can pull more than they can carry uh, in theory if you've got a good card good harness good road donkey can pull probably two three times its own weight uh, and only carry half to two thirds that's maximum when i'm talking remember my background is basically developing countries so when i'm talking about those weights some of you may be going as far too much that's fine we're looking at the figures now where i work donkeys pull and carry a lot more than that so um it's kind of if we can get them down to that we're we're winning but if those of you who think that's too much that's fine you know we're looking, we won't get into that at the moment we're looking at it so yeah they could they do pull pretty well i don't know i've never heard that they are more efficient when they pull than when they carry um i would think probably my instinct is to say no they would probably pull and carry about the same they haven't got the sort of the must the muscles that a horse has in the back legs for pulling and the front legs for pulling that would be my instinct interestingly uh, john from taranaki sent me a thing last night about the, the army in the second world war where donkeys and mules regularly carried two to three times their own weight which is quite staggering quite staggering um so i haven't probably haven't answered your question very thoroughly there but uh, i can't really say much more than that but, um, to me they pull and carry pretty much the same but i think you're going to touch at the end chris on some of the things that donkey sanctuary is working on and maybe how we might answer some of those questions in in the future as some of the research yeah we we've been doing a lot of trials um as to what they can uh sort of on harness and things trying to make harness more efficient uh the other thing that's just coming to my head is there's some work by ann pearson back in the uh, early to early thousands late 90s relating to the fact that uh, donkeys pull and carry more efficiently when they carry a slightly heavier load than they do when they carry a light load um, anybody wants to know more on that i can find the paper it's a scientific paper um, i just read the conclusions i'm afraid i'm not, I'm not a scientist <laughs> cool chris yeah that's good on you go let's take us into fitting in general right so we're gonna <clears throat> what i thought i'd do with this <coughs> Excuse me. <coughs> so that wasn't too loud. Um, I'm just going to skim through this and allow you to come back at me and ask me questions or ask me to 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 expand on the subject because it's uh, harness fitting is a massive subject on its own, um, and a lot of you probably know a lot more than I do. So hopefully you can answer some of the questions too if I can answer. This is a full set of harness. Unfortunately, it's a horse, not a donkey quite hard to find good pictures of donkeys but uh, you can see for those of you new to harness it's quite a bewildering set of straps and buckles and and fittings uh, we've got 33 parts on that picture so we're just going to break that down a little bit for those of you who are perhaps not quite so familiar with it these pictures are taken from the overseas booklet so uh, the bridle looks a little strange there for you um, so we have the steering or the communication system. There's only four systems in harness, four functions of harness. And we'll start with the first function being the communication or even control if necessary system. This one's not actually in the good harness guide because a lot of the countries I work in do not use a bridle or reins. They use voice command sticks. Um, they, we don't really want them to start putting pieces of metal in the donkey's mouth, so we, we don't even mention it. So this has come out of a supplement to the good harness guide uh, so that's your reins bridle bit if you're using the bit uh, for direction control stopping starting um, communication basically along with the voice and if you use a whip along with the whip 
when we look at the draft power, this could be a full collar or a breast collar. The breast collar in the picture here. So basically, it's two straps with some connection, whether it be leather, rope, chain, whatever, to a swingle tree, which is fixed onto your load, whether that's a cart or the, uh, the tool or whatever you're using. So it's actually quite simple when we look at it like this. There's your saddle. The saddle has two jobs. It's if you have two wheel cart, it stops the shafts. It keeps the the cart level, stops the shafts hitting the ground or going up in the air. It's a a saddle with two straps, a girth and a um, and the shaft straps uh, and a belly band. Sorry, three straps really, unless they're all connected. Um, and the last system is the breaching, which is your brakes. Which uh, I don't, I don't, I don't, can you, I don't know if you can see my cursor, but if I put the cursor up here, the breaching is just attached to the shafts here. So if we think of harness like that, we've simplified it down a lot more. So everything else on that picture we saw first of all on the horse. Uh, some of it's necessary if you're doing some things. A lot of it's perhaps not necessary. There's little bits and pieces you can put on which are helpful. So I'm guessing that most of you in the UK and uh, Europe or the United States, wherever you're listening from, um, who drive donkeys for pleasure have had some training or grown up with them. And you know how to hitch, you know what harness is, you know how to put it on. Um, and most of your animals, unless you are a trainer yourself, uh, most of your animals will have been trained for you or will have some training. So this is quite an important point. The animals actually understand the signals you're sending down the reins. Uh, one thing we find in working overseas is we take away a bad bit and put in a very, very mild bit. And of course, the animal is just not used to it. You need to retrain the owner and the animal at the same time. So I'm guessing most of you are working with trained animals. If you're not, then Ben is your man for that because uh, there's probably nobody better in the country at the moment than Ben on uh, training. I've got to say that because he's a host and he'll cut me off a little bit. So I'm just going to put up some headers and um, we'll have a quick run through those. And if you get any questions on them, that would be fantastic. So the bridle, start from the head. Bridles, I mean, donkeys have a bigger forehead and the, uh, the ears are different. So it's hard to find a bridle that fits. And I don't know if I've missed a line on the last slide or not, but anyway, one of the problems we have is that most of the harness we're trying to work with is pony or cob harness built for horses. I don't know if that's the case for you. Um, a lot of people I know are trying to find harness or so put bits and pieces of harness together to make a set that fits out of horse harness. Well, obviously a donkey is not a horse, it's a different shape. So we have some of these problems are common, things like the broader forehead and the, and the big ears. And it uh, can be hard to get a bridle that fits. And sometimes one of the most co common problems I see would be that the brow band is a little bit tight, but the people think, nah, it'll do, I can get it on. That pulls the, the uh, headpiece back behind the ears. And if you just put your finger in behind your ear here and push, it's really painful. I don't know if it's that bad for a donkey, but I would imagine it probably is. So uh, please make sure that your brow band is not, you should be able to get a finger in behind the brow band easily. If you can't, check your headpiece, make sure it's not tight in behind the donkey's ears. Blinkers. Uh, man, I hate blinkers. Um, mostly because of my work overseas. I've seen blinkers. I've seen animals lose eyes through bad blinkers. Very often they're sort of flapping around the, uh, the ears or flapping around the mouth and nowhere near the eyes. And most places I work are very dusty and windy. So the blinkers are beautiful funnels. They just funnel all that rubbish straight into the eye. But because people who overseas have seen them or have been told they need them years and years ago, they keep on making them and they insist on using them. Um, so personally, I don't like blinkers. Uh, but that's up to, I, I know people, a lot of people think that they are 100% necessary. That's fine. Make sure they're in the right place. Make sure they don't get near the eyes. Um, yeah, just one of the cheaper sets are a bigger problem. They're not quite so fixed as they are on the better sets. Uh, the throat latch, sometimes on a pony or a cob bridle, they can be a little bit tight under the chin here. Okay, so when you're driving, you probably want it tighter than normal. So if I was riding, I'd have a hand, a hands gap. But I'm driving, you want sort of two, three fingers, perhaps a little bit tighter. Um, the breast collars. Now, this is a problem. This is an interesting one. We've done a lot of work on collars in the last couple of years. 
but let's start with the basics. So the breast color that you see on horses a lot works well on the horse, not, not a problem. The donkeys are slightly different. The, uh, donkeys have a narrower chest and you've got the point of the shoulder. If you go to your donkey later on and just feel on there, you can feel the point of the shoulder. I hope you can see that in the video. Uh, your breast color wants to be above that, but not so high that it starts to choke the donkey under the neck. That's the space you've got to do that is really small on the donkey. And it obviously depends on your donkey, but it's really small. And there's a couple of things you can do if you don't have much space. You can get a collar that has a, a cup cut out of the front. So it fits in like that rather than like that. You've probably seen those. And that's a very simple uh, type of uh, breast collar. Quite easy to do. And doesn't shouldn't cost any more than an ordinary breast collar. So it does allow just a, a little bit extra space. Um, and the W colors, there's a W shaped colors. That's an interesting one. We've, um, we did some work with those on our trials and our trials have been massive. I mean, we've had weeks, we've walked something like 200 kilometers up and down yards and we've had pressure tests and all sorts of tests going on. We've had 10 donkeys working. We pulled different weights on with sleds and carts and all sorts. The W colors that we were using were not really giving us, uh, they don't appear to have given us very good results. We don't know yet. We haven't analyzed all the results. We seem to be getting us a pressure point at the top here. And um, yeah, I'm not too sure on W colors at the moment, although the, the easy fit colors or whatever they call them, the, um, the different trade people have different uh, names for their particular variety. So if you get on with them, great. But if you're going to, thinking about getting one, I should reckon perhaps you can try one first or talk to a friend who's got one and just see. And when you get one, just basically with all the harness, keep an eye on it when you're starting out with a new piece of harness. Keep a close eye on it. Make sure your donkey's not struggling this one. Chris, I've got a, a couple of questions. Uh, yeah. Uh, I'm mentioning, uh, I think you mentioned empathy breast collar. Um, Christine uh, has sort of put a question mark by that. And, the, and do you mean an empathy uh, type collar when you say a Y collar? Yeah, the W collar, Y collar, empathy collar. Uh, they all come under the same heading. Uh, we'll talk a bit later about a new contact I've made uh, in the United States just over the last couple of days. Um, and I know that they're making these colors specifically for donkeys and mules. So I, I, I'm not, I don't actually know whether the one that we had for the trial, it was donated to us, whether it was actually just a cob horse one or whether it was a specific donkey one. So I'm a little bit sort of, I just have my reservations about them at this stage. Okay. Um, uh, and we can... Christina also yeah. asked about um, a buckled headpiece. She had one made so as not to push the ears around. You know, yeah. in an ideal world, would you recommend uh, um, that headpiece being buckled so you don't have to sort of bend the donkey's ears through the head collar or through the bridle? Has that got a buckle on top of the head, can we ask her? I'm not yeah. quite sure what she means by a buckled headpiece. Yeah, I'm guessing what she means, uh, Christine just confirmed this on the chat box, but uh, um, just generally being able to undo it rather than a solid piece that you... Um, post the donkey's ears through, which is uh, yeah. what some people people tend to do. Yeah, uh, not really come across those to be honest, Christine. Um, so long as the buckle underneath the buckle, so long as there's no pressure points there, I'm not quite sure where the buckle would be. Would it be on the pole? Um, that would be quite a nasty place to have a pressure point. But I'm no, sure, I think that sounds. I'm sure that Christine sounds like a, will come back to us with that, Chris. But she said she had yeah. it ma made for them, so I'm um, sure she's thinking yeah. ahead and 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 maybe all. Uh, cool. we'll find out a bit from her but yeah that's cool carry on sorry to, to yeah. jump in there actually the other thing you can do with the headpiece is you can get a headpiece that has uh, little cups cut out behind the ears as well so instead of a straight sla uh, strap it's actually a strap on the, on the front behind the ears as little cutouts those are quite easy to make they wouldn't cost any more to make either i don't think it shouldn't do um that, does that make sense can you understand what i'm saying there yeah, yeah, and Christine's yeah. about to say, yeah, like a head collar resting on a pad um, used for mules in, in the US. Yeah. So, yeah. Yeah, it sounds, yeah. And basically, Christine, if it's working for you, or more importantly, working for your donkey, go for it. I'm, uh, one thing I've learned over the last 20 odd years is 
as an English harness maker, we're sent out into the world believing that we're the best harness makers in the world and that the English system is the best system in the world. Um, over the last 20 years, one thing I've learned is that's not true. There's some really good stuff out there. And if it works for you and your donkey, I have no problem with it at all. That sounds like a good idea to me. Uh, anything, else, anything else on those, Ben? Or no, we, no, good, good. Yeah, yeah, go for cool. it. You carry on. Okay. So look at the full colours. Um, the English standard closed full colour that we use on horses. We obviously can't use that on a donkey or that type because the donkey's head is bigger. So those of you who may not know, a uh, horse collar on a horse, you put it on upside down and turn it around. But when it's gone past the head, you can give it a twist and it'll go around a, a, a horse's neck. Donkey color, the head is, you can't do that with a donkey. Uh, the head is too big, you can't get it over the head. So we have to have an open top collar. Um, and the thing about that is that you can't just take an open top horse collar and put it on a donkey because the shoulders are a different shape. Okay, so you need to get one that's actually made for your donkey or that you know fits your donkey at least. Um, the hybrid colors is a sort of combination between the, bro uh, the breast collar and the, the full collar trying to get the best of both worlds if you like so we're trying to get a collar that is um, transferable because a full collar is really made for one animal a breast collar is more transferable so the hybrid is more transferable the full collar is a very skilled job to make i wasn't even allowed to touch a collar for three years uh, my first collar making course i wanted to go on a course after three and a half years i was told no wait give it another few months um, and do some repairs. So, so I did, I started on repairs for Acton Scott Farm Museum, Working Farm Museum, where the Victorian farm was filmed, uses their collar repairs. And then I went to make my first collar. I probably got nearly three and a half, four years experience by then before I was even allowed to do that. Breast collars are easy to make. I'm teaching to make a breast collar in a day. So the hybrid is a combination of the two. Um, and they're looking really good. In the trials that we've done, the, the indications are that we've got a couple of hybrids that are really, really good. So um, we, if anybody's interested in those, then you, my email address will come up at the end. Let me know. Uh, the saddles, the donkey backs are, are different. They're flatter and shorter. Uh, makes actually saddle fitting a lot easier on a donkey. One problem we had is, is that the, the saddle, the, the girl strap tends to always slip forward because the donkey has such a rounded belly like a, like a pony. And the girl strap always wants to come up behind the legs. Uh, the back strap, sometimes on a, a converted horse set, they can be a little bit long, so make sure you can get it short enough. Bridging, I don't think we had too much problem with the bridgings. Uh, you can usually find one for a horse that will fit a donkey. Um, if you've got problems, let me know. Um, oops, didn't go. There we go. So going back to the colors, do you want a full color or a breast color? So the breast color is cheaper, it's transferable, it's easy to repair, um, but it is more suitable for higher hitching points. Okay, so if you're going to pull a, a small cultivator, a set of harrows, um, your breast, breast color is not really the ideal thing for it because the breast color sits on a donkey at that angle and the traces come up at this angle. So as soon as you pull, you're doing that. You, you haven't got a nice straight line of pull. There are ways of doing it. You can make a very long breast collar that comes off and sort of curves down like that and then comes down like that, uh, which is slightly better. They do that in Africa quite a lot. But really, if you're pulling loads on the, on the low level, cultivators, logs, um, sleds, those sort of things, you really should be looking at a collar, in my opinion. Um, so the full collar is better. And it's, oh, sorry, also the breast collar is not as efficient. Okay, you're pulling on a smaller area of the animal. So if you're pulling a heavy load, you're putting more pressure on this small area. So a, a full collar is better suited for heavier work and is more adaptable for low and high hitching points. Um, I think there's a study out a few years back which suggests that the breast collar is about 25% less efficient than the full collar. Okay, there's not been a lot of uh, study done on these things with donkeys at least. And the, the one I'm referring to with horses. So it's kind of difficult to be exact on that. But um, yeah, so my sort of guess is between 20 and 25% less efficiency with a breast collar, which is why we're working on the hybrids, because if we can get the collars more efficient, 
overseas and the donkeys in theory don't have to work so much so the hybrid is an attempt to make colors the best for both okay uh, that's what i use um i know john and fiona online they've been they've seen the colors i made down with them and we've done timber pulling cart work harrowing um we just built a little four cart down there and we're using the same color for everything and we've had no problems at all with that color uh well, apart from the mice jonathan the mice uh, ate the lining but uh, that's on the bench here waiting for repair uh probably a good time to take a little break here has anybody got any questions uh, how are we doing ben uh no we're pretty good apart from um where can liz has asked where she can get access a copy of the good harness guide mm -hmm. yeah that's easy enough that's uh, if you go onto the donkey sanctuary website and put in good harness guide it comes up in six languages which is incredible um you won't get the the bitting the head the bitting guide that's i've got that on my laptop but as i said we don't use it very often i don't we don't put it out because i don't really want people who know nothing about bridles and bits to be able to access information and go sticking welded together nails in their donkey's mouths we uh, we see a lot of problems with those now the good highness guide is it's a it's a very very basic okay it's base it's it's designed it was designed as pictorial it was designed for people who don't speak english or have a minimum of english uh, who have no idea what harness is at all so it just goes through in more or less pictorial form how harness works um cards keeping your tires inflated things like that but it's free it's on the donkey it's on the donkey sanctuary website uh, go ahead and get it yeah you can have it in french spanish english Chinese, uh, Swahili, and uh, there's another language in there, so I can't remember what it is. Yeah. Um, Chris, can can you also? There's a couple of people asking about uh, pictures of the hybrid collar. I, I'm reluctant to get you to dig into your computer and find a picture of that right now, but um, either at the very end, or if people email you, um, I know you're going to put your email address up at the end. Um, if yep. you want to see a picture of a hybrid. Yep. Uh, collar so the best yep. way to do that is if you hang on to the end chris's email will come up and you can email him directly and i'm sure he'll be happy to uh, attach a picture and, and have that discussion with you i think we might even have one coming up i'm sorry i've been working on two powerpoints at the same time the last couple of days and i know i've got a picture on one of the powerpoints and i can't remember which one but if you're lucky it's coming up in a minute <laughs> <laughs> that worries me slightly chris uh, who knows what's coming next but back uh, to you. Yeah. yeah keep yeah, going yeah. we're doing well There you go. Yeah, I thought it was there. <clears throat> so there's a hybrid color there. Um, this is one anybody could actually make, and there will be full instructions uh, available sometime in the near future. This is the one we've been working. This is uh, Zach Dan. He's, he's one of the Ponwe donkeys down in Taranaki, um, and we've been doing a lot of work with this color. Uh, I don't know. Ben, can you hear me? Can you see my cursor if I roll my cursor? Yeah, yeah, yeah we can see that. Ah, just, cool. Yeah. yeah, okay, that's really good. So what I've done is taken a, um, it's got a bit of a lineage, it's good scholar. It started off, we believe, and it's all lost in the mists of time. Um, a Spanish guy, Abel, you may even be listening, Abel, if you are. Hola, como estas? Um, he took this idea, I think he told me, from a French military color. And he has developed it into a working collar originally for his horse. It's sort of spreading slowly across southern Spain and up into Portugal. The Zhao, I don't know if you're listening, but uh, he uses this collar as well. Um, I've taken the idea and I've tried to simplify it as much as I can. Uh, not that their idea is particularly complicated, or the way they make it is that complicated, but it does need specialist tools, as in uh, cutters and uh, welders and things, which we don't always have. So at the top here, I've used a couple of wire strainers, front and back. So the top, I can close that top in. This lifts up over the top. It's on a it's fixed this end. So it literally clips down over like that. But I can adjust the length of these pieces here infinitely within a certain range, depending on the size of my wire strainers. Down here, I've used a, a old hinge. And we have a pin through that. You can't see it on the picture, but we drop a pin through that with a D on it. So we have a D there, or we can put the D on the top one there. We can put the D in the middle between the two, or we can put the D underneath. 
and a pin drops down through there. So it gives me three hitching points. On the bottom, I've got the wire strain as well. This is the original version with the one on the front. We've gone to two because that one broke. So what I've got there is a collar that I can adjust to the top. I can adjust to the bottom. I have three hitching points. And the wood was taken from a cardboard um, template of Zach's neck. So I know the wood fits his neck. So it's a very, very simple collar. And it's working really nicely. You can't really see the padding behind because we used uh, sheepskin. This is the one that the uh, the mice are having quite. <laughs> so it's about to be recovered. Uh, but it's got a sheepskin uh, padding behind there, just a simple pad covering everything up and a strap. It doesn't sit on here. It's got a neck strap. You can just see the back of the neck strap there. And that's on a couple of Ds. It goes over the top of the neck to the other side and that's what uh, holds the collar in place. That's working really nicely. So we've done a lot of trials with that. In uh, We did uh, six weeks in Portugal uh, two, two and a half years ago. Uh, we walked about 140K. And this is one of the colors we tried. We've got another even simpler one, which we tried as well, and they're looking really good. Uh, of course, the big problem perhaps for the European uh, pleasure drivers, if you like, is it's, it doesn't look, it doesn't perhaps not gonna fit in with your European English style harness. But if you want to work with if you want to work with donkeys at all, which I do, uh, we're really liking this collar. It's uh, the horses that I know in Spain are using it. Um, some of them I know work full time, uh, probably a six hour day, and they are doing all sorts of work, plowing, timber work, the whole lot, and they're using a slightly obviously a bigger version of this, um, and they have no problems whatsoever with it. It's a really good collar. If you want to know more about that, let me know. Okay, we, um, I'm just finishing off the training module on how to make that, which will at some time in the future uh, become available anyway. Uh, we know that the collar works. We've done our tests on it, but also we've seen it working and we have testimony from people who work with it all the time. So we have no reservations about this collar at all. If you're interested, give me a call. <coughs> And bits, uh, yes, bits. Um, this is going to hopefully bring up quite a few questions. Um, so I know that it's gone out, and I think Ben sent a question here out to you. So I'm hoping there's been questions asked on it. Uh, I'm guessing that the questions will be along the lines of do I need a bit with a donkey? What type of bit should I use with a donkey? Um, one that's uh, come across myself, quite an interesting one is of course uh, the donkey gets his tongue over the bits on a regular basis. What do I do about that? Uh, bitless bridles, hackamores, and uh, you might want might be interested in other methods as they're used around the world. Um, have we got anything on bits coming in, Ben? Hello, Ben. Uh, yep, um, when we asked uh, people, they're just filling in the poll at the moment. Um, oh, okay. People, uh, driving uh using a bit um 48 of people are saying 50 percent of people are saying yes always four percent say never bitless bridle seven percent say never head collar 15 percent saying sometimes and the remaining 25 percent are on uh i don't drive my donkeys okay so yeah that's a good range eh? the, the good range a bit 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 is still most common uh generally across the board there um so yeah, probably 50, 60% of people are using the bit at least sometimes. Yeah, okay. So I'll just run through what I think. And if anybody disagrees or has any questions, we can we'll have time for that in a minute. So do you need to use a bit at all? Um, I'm trying to train the donkeys I'm working with at the moment to work without the bit. I would admit one of the reasons for that is that um, there will be a lot of students driving these donkeys and those students may not have any experience. So in my mind i'm thinking if they haven't got a bit they can't do so much damage um am i pro or anti bit i think probably i'm pro bit i probably do prefer to have a bit in the mouth i just feel slightly more secure um and i also it does depend on that on the training of the animal if your animal's responding really well then head color is fine but if it's not responding that well you can do some damage with the head color as well and sometimes a bit is just enough to grab the animal's attention and say, oh, yeah, he's talking to me, I better listen. Whereas a tug on the head collar, 
my fault I need to train the animals better, I guess, at the end of the day. What type of bitch should I use on a donkey? I have a liking for the straight, uh, sorry, the mullen mouth snaffle bit. Depending on the animal's size of his mouth, I sort of tend to think something about the size of my finger is a good sort of size to go in. If it's too big, it's, it's a physically it's a mouthful. You can't get his mouth around it. If it's too narrow, it cuts into the corners of the lips. So I do like the mullen mouth snaffle. If I'm overseas, I don't use that. I use a straight bar. If we do any bitting at all, I use a straight bar snaffle. And the reason for that is we used to do mullen mouth years ago. We gave out quite a few in one country or another. And we found people putting them in backwards. So uh, we went to a straight bar, which can't be put in backwards, basically. Donkey gets his tongue over the bit. What can I do? Now, this has been an interesting one. We all love this question. So I went to uh, our colleague, Corinne, uh, on a bench, uh, I say protege, she's not really a protege, Ben. She's, uh, I'm not quite sure. She's, she works with Ben anyway on the behaviorism team. She's amazing in her own right. Yeah, definitely. Yep, she's really, really good. Um, and she could basically came back and said, you know, we need to do, you need to do more training. You need to perhaps take the bit out, uh, try different bits. All very good advice. Uh, so you can, basically, you want to get back in the ring and retrain. Maybe start without a bit at all and just start going off from uh, head collar commands, roll left, right, stop. So you can use your voice command to take over a little bit. You can try different types of metal bits. You can try the roller bits. You get bits with bits of copper, brass, all sorts of metal work in there that tastes slightly different. Sometimes that might just take the donkey's mind off the bit itself. I did wonder about trying keys. Um, Corinne didn't actually come back on that one because the old training bits used to have keys in them that the donkeys can play with. Uh, one, I actually, I, I emailed a colleague of mine, a, a good friend of mine for the last 35 years we trained together and he had a big shop. Um, so I emailed him and said, somebody comes into your shop and says, the uh, animal's getting a tongue over the bit, what can we do? Uh, stick a port in, stick a ported bit in. Um, and that's probably a pretty stock answer, but it's probably not the answer we're looking for. I think most of us would rather, obviously if the, to if the donkey's getting his tongue over the bit, it's because the donkey either prefers it that way or the donkey's in pain and it reduces the pain a little bit. No pun intended there. Um, so you need to be looking at why the donkey's getting his tongue over. And of course with donkeys as well, the other thing is once they've got their tongue over once, and I know it really, really gets to you, um, they just do it for fun as well. So we've got that problem as well. The traditional way of solving the problem is to stick a big port in or stick a flash band on the donkey, stop him open his mouth, clamp it all down. He can't speak to you. He can't tell you he's in pain or anything else. So problem solved. We like to look a little bit beyond that. So really what we're saying is you can try different types of bits. If you're not using a, a, a plain snapple or even a rubber bit, Try if you're using something uh, like a sort of pellet type bit, a driving bit, try coming back down the scale. Don't go up the scale, come back down the scale, see if that's more comfortable. Try different bits. You might just find that that's just uncomfortable for your donkey and he wants something a different shape, different thickness, different material. If none of that works, it's just going to get back into the training ring and you're back to basics. Just deviate here a little bit. A friend of mine years ago had a, a horse. Uh, fjord and he was brilliant i could walk up to him in the field put a head collar on him lead him up to the barn drop the head collar on the floor walk into the barn get the harness harness him up absolutely perfect until it was a day when he didn't want to be perfect remember the last time he did that he bolted with a tractor tire behind him went through three sets of sheet netting and barbed wire destroyed the fences destroyed the harness didn't actually hurt himself at all. He was a sod. And um, my friend came over, he had a lot of experience with training horses, and he said, Right, the first thing before we start is he head collar trained. I said, Come on, mate, of course he's head collar trained. No, we're a year and a half down the road here, and we did head collar training years ago. Right, show me. Put a head collar on him, let him around the field. To my mind, he was head collar trained. My friend said, That is not head collar trained. I didn't know what he meant. Basically, he wanted the horse to be at my shoulder. 
he didn't he wanted me a bit to be able to walk fast forward and suddenly turn right or left or stop and the horse stayed at my shoulder didn't barge me didn't push past me didn't the horse was focused totally on me I said do that I'll come back in a month so I think it's very tempting with basic training sometimes to think yep I've got it that's good enough maybe we need to spend more time with the head color I'm becoming a as I get older I'm becoming a bigger and bigger believer in the fact that this basic training is so necessary. And I know with my friend's horses, he had two young um, Normandy cobs. He could get those horses to do anything he wanted because he'd spent, from the age of two, one and a half, two, when he got them, he spent every day, he would do something with them with the head collar. And he could, after six months, he could they would do whatever he wanted. They were fantastic. So getting tongue over the bits is a complicated question. We've, um, sorry, I've rambled on there a little bit, probably half you've gone to sleep. Um, it's a very complicated question. We're working on it. All we can suggest is you just try everything you could think of. Come back to me on that one. Let me know how you get on. If you've got any ideas too, let me, let me know. Bitless bridles, bridles, hackamores, those sort of things. Mm. People love them, people hate them. Um, I'm on the fence. I don't have a lot of experience with them. Um, I have a friend who drives with them. Uh, to me, you just replace the pressure on the in the mouth with the pressure on the nose. Um, I mean, I can't say as I like them that much, but I think really it's a personal choice. And again, listen to your animal. Your animal will tell you if it prefers it to a bit uh, by its behaviour, by the way it reacts. So if you like them and they work for your animal, fantastic. Um, and I'm talking more about the sort of yeah, the hackamore and the, the sort of the nose pressure systems rather than just working off the head collar there. Other methods used around the world. A lot of the world, as I've said several times tonight or this morning, don't use um, the bit at all or any head collar or any reins. They use a stick um, and they use voice commands. There's quite a famous story within the donkey sanctuary of Dr. Svensson years ago when she was in uh, on the island of Lamu in Kenya saw a man with a big stick waving it around the donkey's head and was about to rush over and start to uh, tell the man that he mustn't beat his donkey when she realized he was actually blowing down this hollow piece of bamboo into the donkey's ear and he was controlling his donkey with blows in the donkey's ear literally like that and the donkey was responding of course, voice commands, we all use those. Um, I think we can do a lot more with the voice and um, signals than probably most of us even think. The guy in the video we saw earlier on, and the harness is horrible, the, the cart was horrible, the roads are horrible, the guy's got a big stick in his hand, but he was just tapping the donkeys at the most. And he was you could see he had his hand on the donkey's back, you could see by his body language that he actually cares about his donkeys. I have no problem with any of those systems. I don't think there's any communication system that is bad. There are just people who misuse them. So they always say it's not the bit, it's the hands. It's the same with the stick. It's not the stick, it's the man behind the stick. Um, whatever system you're using, it depends on the way you use it. So we've got some contacts here. Um, so in the UK, it can be kind of hard to find harness for donkeys. Um, so actually, I've been in touch with the uh, the, the uh, Donkey Society on the on the Facebook, and they've had a couple of people that they have um, recommended to me. So we've got uh, Martin down in Cornwall. Uh, he's been recommended by by others to me, and I was, I sent him an email and asked if I could put his um, contact details up, and he sent me a really good email back. He does a lot of bespoke work, um, so if you looking for anybody to make you something or change something, have a chat to him. Uh, the other ones that were sent through was Waldingham Saddlers. Uh, I didn't actually know where Waldingham was, but I found it. It's uh, in Surrey. And I think they make made to major um, bits as well. I don't know about colours with either of them, uh, but those are the only two I've got in the UK at the moment. And the and only Chris, person... Oh, yeah. oh, I'm just going to jump in because Carol was uh, giving us... Um... Uh, a lot of people in the UK use a, a Zilco synthetic harness. Uh, it's uh, typically yep. sized and, and, and a mixture of Shetland, 
pony and cob, which is easy to buy uh, strap by strap uh, to get a good fit. So just throwing that in there for anybody. Uh, yeah. That's really useful to know. I think somebody did mention that too to me. Uh, Zilco will sell you different size straps so you can actually match, mix and match with the Zilco harness. Um, which of course is a perfectly good set of synthetic harness. Uh, easy to look after, easy to clean, very strong. And they will sell you a mix and match set. And you just tell them what sizes you want. So that's really good to know. Thank you, Carol. Really good. If you go further afield, now uh, a couple of my colleagues have set up this equidpower.org. Okay, if you see that at the top address there, if you go online and look for that, this is the directory that has been set up by uh, some of my colleagues in the Donkey Sanctuary. Uh, and in there is a directory. They've invited everybody that they can find at the moment in the world to log in and enter on this directory. So wherever you are in the world, go on there and see if there's anybody in your country. Um, obviously, since we come from the donkey sanctuary, a lot of those people would be supplying for donkeys and mules. And that's not just harness, that is also farriers, I believe, and uh, machinery makers, plow makers in play, for example, in, in, South Africa, in Zimbabwe, uh, cart makers. Everyone. We're working on the list all the time, what my colleagues are, um, but we've got a good start on there. You can get that online. Spanish collars, um, I recommend Abel. I know Abel well. I've been down there a couple of times. He works horses, he works mules, he works donkeys. He's a really knowledgeable guy on the Spanish version of the collars, which we'll look at a couple of pictures in a minute. I got a lot of respect for these collars. Um, he's also a farrier. He's, his family have a just over a hectare of uh, market garden, and they use a the horse there. Um, and they do courses. If anyone's interested in just going down and trying, where better to go than the south of Spain for a course when he's literally five miles from the beach, I think. Um, you can go down there and stop in the town or stop, or maybe even stop at the house and watch your But he, you can go down there and do a course with a bell. He has one course which I really love to do, which you basically sign up for the year and you go once a month. So you learn the whole agricultural year or market gardening year. Obviously, it's Spain, not UK or any other country, but. The systems are the same. Um, really nice guy, speaks good English, and a really good uh, color maker. So give him a bell if you've got any, if you're interested in any of the Spanish type ones. I've come across this uh, Chimacum Tac. Uh, Chimacum. They're in the States. Yeah, so Chris. I've had uh, a lot of conversations with uh, Jenny. Jump in there for you, yeah. Chris, just to say that Trudy um, does a lot of driving and, and she uses them. Um, great, great harness, she says. Um, so there's a little bit of feedback. Which one? Uh, for the tune match, tune match, great. Yeah, well, however, really pronouncing it, yeah, no, um, uh, tune match, uh, tack, yeah, Trudy saying it's great. So, um, we'll trust Trudy's uh, knowledge, um, uh, there. So, that's yeah, the recommendation. And, and I'm conscious we've got a lot to get through, Chris. So, I'm saving some more questions for you to, to the end. So, if you want to jump into the next part of, yeah, we're nearly uh, there, uh, <laughs> that'll be good. Yeah. Cool. Yeah, okay. we're nearly there. Back to you. Um, yeah, so, yeah, Chimacum Tax sounds good then. And I've had I've had about 10 emails to and from with Janie from there. Uh, and she's also recommended me to uh, join the Small Farmers Journal, which I've just done, actually. I've, I've uh, registered to get a copy of that online. It's uh, $5 a month, I think I'll pay for that. Looks like a really useful journal with a lot of horse stuff going on there. A, uh, the United States... Uh, it's got so much uh, horse work going on at the moment, it's fantastic. So, as I <laughs> rather timely from Ben's interruption, well, not, sorry, not interruption, Jen's, Ben's comment, uh, I have no idea how much time we got left, we're probably running out. Um, so I'm, I'm going to be here all morning, I'm just starting my working day, so if anybody wants to stay on after we finish, that's fantastic. Um, I've got some European stuff to show you. We've looked at some of the overseas stuff, we've had a brief run through UK, fitting it wasn't a particularly in-depth fitting i'm sort of relying on you guys to come back with questions on that rather than anything else we've got some european harness here just have a quick look for interest this is uh, part of the trials we've been doing and this is the color this is the other color so you saw my version of it this is the actual original version from Abel. um and we were doing some timber trials we were pulling trials so we got uh, dynamometers in the in the system there to measure the the, the, the pull 
Um, and this was last year in uh, Galicia, in Spain. And we did some really good work there. This is a Scandinavian set. So this is kind of interesting. Um, you see, we've got this pin here, which is holding the shafts. But the shafts are also the traces and also the swingle tray. There's a hinge at the bottom down here and on the other side. So as the animal moves, that's the swingle tree as well. You can literally pull the pin out of there and unhook the animal, or you can unhook here and put onto something different. So Scandinavian set. The other advantage is because they do a lot of logging there, and this is, you can see a logging sled behind. Uh, the, the terrain is uneven. So as the animal goes up and the sledge is coming down, the change of angle is coming from here. So this angle, the 90 degrees, straight onto the shoulder here, is kept all the time. This is where the angle changes. So interesting system. Don't know much about it myself. Well, that's one of the things I want to do down at the uh, farm, John. What is the best colour for donkeys in your opinion? Okay, so I would like... That's a, that's a, it's, yeah, okay. For my personal preference, I would be using... I like this uh, hybrid colour that I'm using now. I love that colour. Really enjoying using it. <clears throat> if you want to be driving in show, if you've got the money and you're using one animal and the animal is mature and not changing shape very much, then I would be using a proper donkey collar, a traditional donkey collar. They look smart, they fit the donkeys. Uh, I like them a lot. If you are using a, a lot of different animals, if you, uh, even if you don't, don't have the several hundreds of pounds it's going to cost you to get the full collar made and the hames don't forget um, you could be looking at up to a thousand pounds for those, the collar and hames if you if that's not possible for you and you're just pulling a little light vehicle then nothing wrong with the breast collar it really depends on what you're doing it depends on your animal is your animal changing shape if your animal is changing shape do not invest in a, in a, in a full collar okay if your animal is young uh, don't invest in a full collar. If you've just got an animal, don't invest in a full collar. Let it develop into the shape that it will be most of the time with you. The same with, with advice would apply to saddles. Um, so if you've got a young animal, an animal that's developing at the moment, go for a breast collar if you're doing light work or the hybrid collar. If you want to be really smart and um, you know, stretch your stuff, then, I mean, you see these pictures here. There's nothing quite as beautiful as a full collar. Nice pieces of work. Okay, Chris. That um, doesn't good. really answer your question. Please. No, well, it, it does. I think, you know, like all of this stuff that we do, it does depend on the individual animal. It talks about research, looking at what's yeah. right for your supervisor, get some advice before you leap in. I mean, there's several people, Chris, that have, have gone on to recommend uh, the, the Chimacum um, harness um and the service they're getting there obviously that's Great. not a recommendation from the donkey sanctuary but you can see in the chat box where people are doing um that um tom has asked do you think it's possible for the average person to make one of your wooden collars i guess that depends on how average you are tom but um uh what do you think chris <laughs> I think if it's not possible for the average person to make a wooden colour, then I've been wasting the last couple of years because the whole point is that anybody who can use uh, hand tools, okay, and some people just can't do that. But most people, most probably most people listening can. Anybody who can use hand tools can make the colour. Cool. Okay. That, that's yes, good. That's good. Is, yeah, and Tommy's saw, talking you can about it for color. draft work um, rather than just in driving as much. But yeah, I, I guess the principles yep. are going to be the same. Um, and um, we've got a question here. May has asked, do you know, um, sorry, Jane, uh, any comments on using two wheeled or four wheeled uh, vehicles? Yeah. Yeah. So that's a, that's a big enough. That so might be a webinar two -wheel on its own. Yeah, it is almost. I'll just quickly go over the main points. So a two-wheeler is lighter, it's cheaper, okay? Uh, it's it's easy to store. Um, it's got a lot of advantages. Uh, the main one for me being the fact that it's lighter for the donkey to pull, especially if you've only got a single donkey. The four-wheeler, it costs a lot more money. It's, it needs a bigger space to storage. You can't sort of prop the shafts up against the wall and 
sort of tip it in a corner of a garage. It's, it's a fairly big vehicle. Uh, and of course, the weight. They're a lot heavier. So you, for the donkey, even with my rather generous two and a half times donkey's body weight, by the time you take the carriage and the passengers into account, you're getting down to, well, by the time you take the carriage into account, you're getting down to the point where you can hardly carry more than one or two passengers, depending on the carriage and the size of your donkey, obviously. So those are the main problems. And I think, yes, it's, it's, a, it's a problem we have all over the world. Um, the difference in the two and the four wheeler. The big problem with the two wheeler, of course, is balance. And even if you start off balance as soon as you hit a hill, or if you're on rough roads, like that donkey we saw in the video, every time you hit a rut or a stone or a hollow, that balance changes. So it's it's a it's a subject on its own. Uh, you can either email me later, or we can chat on Zoom later if you want to. Um, or we can do a webinar if not people yeah, are interested. I, I do have, I was just thinking, Chris, also to let people know that uh, probably the end of May, maybe the first week of June, um, I'm in discussions uh, with uh, Joao, who's our senior lead in welfare and is very Im involved in the Equine Power Network. And we're hoping to run a webinar where we've got two or three um, very knowledgeable people from Europe. Um, where we're going to have a bit of a panel discussion and that's going to be yep. more around equipment yep. and um, that'll be a great one to come in and ask some of those sorts of questions. A <laughs> couple more <laughs> questions there about, um, May has asked, do you know uh, any place to get a hybrid co collar or did you make your own? Well, we know you made your own, so that's good, which leads into what Joe said. Um, and she says, surely anybody can make a collar, but do they have the skill to make the template, which I think is a brilliant question, um, you know, Perhaps anybody can make yeah, a Yeah, good question. What about, what about that yeah. about the template? Brilliant question, Joe. Yeah. Uh, when the module comes out, it will be step by step, including making the template. Okay. And yes, this is, this is one of the dangers that we have when we go um, teaching online, is the fact that we are giving information to people that we can't see what they're doing. So if you're in a classroom and somebody, you show somebody how to make a template and they start to do it wrong, you can say, whoa, hang on a minute, you haven't quite got that right, let's have a look. Um, online, once they've got the information, we can't see. So the, the modules that we're making are really step-by-step. -step. Cool, um, yeah, and obviously um, the thing that we're working on at the Donkey Sanctuary at the moment is um, our Donkey University, which um, we're busy trying to um, create a lot of content for um, about harness and behavior and, and welfare and veterinary topics. So that will be coming up later in the year and, and certainly into the beginning of next year, which is going to be a huge resource for everybody. So bear with us as we, we build all of that. Uh, it's a bit of a behavior thing and, and chris talked about the donkeys getting the tongue over the bit you know we, we've always got to be asking why what's comfortable why is your donkey doing what he's doing um you know if they're getting the tongue over the bit um is it there's a teeth problem is the bit uncomfortable um always be asking why before we just jump to a bigger bit you know it's it does come back to what corinne had said to chris about training and understanding your donkey and being as light as possible not just scaling up more pressure um the donkey's got a reason for everything they do so come back into to finding out what's comfortable for your donkey Fareed from Egypt was going to ask you a question, but he hasn't come back to me with what about uh, body condition, uh, body confirmation. And I guess that, yeah. that there's so many different donkeys um, around the world and you've got to look at that confirmation of each donkey. Yeah, it's an interesting question from Fareed. Um, Fareed's one of my protégés in Egypt, uh, so it's a good question. Obviously, he's looking at it from the wounds point of view, I expect. <clears throat> if your animal has not got good body con body condition score, and we use a one to five score, one being very, very thin, five being obese, um, <clears throat> then you're going to get wounds if he's, if he's thin or your animal is thin, so sort of one to two. I think that's probably what Ferdy is referring to. So you should be looking at an ideal body condition score of two and a half to three, which is uh, yeah, ideal, not fat, not thin. And he's also mentioning, um, you know, if they have poly problems, you know, in, in these countries um, that you've worked in a lot, Chris, you know, with confirmation. So such as um, problems in the back and stuff like that. Can, can you have to adjust yeah. the harness to take into consideration those sorts of problems that you might be seeing in an individual donkey? Yes, yeah, a lot of the countries we work in, they don't breed the donkeys. 
So the donkeys are basically chucked out. And at the end of the day, they have some of them are free range, some of them are scavenging around the streets, some of them are allowed up into the fields. Uh, they breed as and when they find a mate, pretty much any time they want. Um, and you can see some terrible confirmation. And it's one of the problems we've got, sort of tried to discuss several times with people. But of course, it's, it's, it's such a massive problem. Um, okay, Chris. Um, a couple of questions. Liz, right. Chris, what do you think about driving mini donkeys? Uh, those around 36 inches or thereabouts. What sort of weight should they pull? Or have you had any experience of this? No, I've had no experience of that. Um, but I have no, yeah, I, I think they, I've seen them. And yeah, watch the weight. And you got to, uh, presumably, you'd be working with a team. And you'd have to be working with a team unless you've got a sort of three or four year old in a little tiny cart uh, being pulled by them. But uh, yeah, work on the same sort of principles as you would on the bigger donkey, as far as I know. Uh, ben, I don't know if you have any thoughts on that one. Do you know anything about it? Um, but I would say, yeah, look at the same sort of scale. So if you've got a mini donkey, how much does a mini donkey weigh? 50, 60 kilos, something like that. So if you could probably pull something like 150 kilos. If I'm wrong, come back and tell me now because um, I have no real experience. I'm just working off my no, general experience. No, I experience. think that's, that's been my experience, Chris, that mini donkeys, you know, um, yeah. pound for pound will, will do pretty much what... Um, the uh, standard donkey will do um, but it's it's again all about making sure that harness fits and and everything's proportionate you know yep. getting a getting a yep. a cart that's light enough proportionately to the donkey's weight you know for a standard donkey i think you know you get a cart you can add a, an adult onto that but but your cart size because it's fitted to the human doesn't shrink massively for your mini donkey yep. compared to a standard donkey. <clears throat> and so I, I think there's probably less room for, for the leeway of how much the donkeys can pull in that situation because you, you know, um, the carts remain the yeah. same size. Yeah. Good. Um, well, we're, we're really getting through the questions. If anybody's got any final questions, just let us know. Um, if you've got any comments about this evening's webinar, that will be good to hear uh, as well. And, um, I'm going to run one later in the month on using the science of, of behavior to work with and train donkeys. Um, and then we've got one coming up after that about the harness materials and um, equipment as well. So there's lots to keep looking out for. 